It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 173, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Jean-Martin Fortier is most famous for his book, The Market Gardener, based on the high output systems he developed at Quebec's Le Jardin de la Grelinette, where his wife, Maud Alain, currently produces over $150,000 of produce on an acre and a half of production ground. Jean Martin currently farms at La Ferme de Quatre Temps, an enlarged version of the same model on six acres of production ground, where he's been farming now for three years. We dig into the foundations of JM's production model from high fertility to an emphasis on weed prevention and how that model has translated to more acres on his new project. JM reflects on the changed constraints with his new farm, and we discuss the lessons that JM has learned about personnel with a much larger crew and a different role for himself within it. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company. Founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by Local Food Marketplace, helping farms and food hubs around North America implement easy to use online ordering systems that integrate fully with a full management system for order packing, invoicing, and payment processing. Contact localfoodmarketplace.com to learn more. And by High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving professional organic growers with a full line of 100% certified organic and non-GMO project verified vegetable, herb, flower, and cover crop seeds. Highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer. JM Fortier, welcome back to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hey, Chris. I'm really happy to be back on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. So I want to start off now. The last time you were on the show was back episode 36, which was in the fall of 2015. And here we are in August. Well, by the time this goes live, it'll be August of 2018. So it's been quite a while and you've been up to quite a bit of stuff. But can you give me kind of the background of the two different farms that you're involved in right now? Yeah. So the story goes that I've been farming at my home farm since 2004 at La Grillinette. So there's, that's where we have an acre and a half under cultivation, my wife and I. And in 2015, I was approached to start another project here in the province of Quebec. This farm is the farm that I'm, I'm working out now on full time. It's a really big farm. There's animals, there's chickens for eggs, there's pigs in the forest and there's cows and there's a six acre market garden which is really designed pretty much the way my home farm was but it's just bigger and I've been running this farm here for the last four years so this is already my fourth season running this project and this farm was initiated by a very wealthy business person that wanted to create a farm that would be an alternative to what farming is today here in Quebec And he wanted to create a farm that was more holistic and that was more ecological. And he wanted me to be behind that project. And I decided to jump on board and it allowed me to, you know, develop my skills and work on designs and some experimental farms. So we're doing a lot of interesting stuff and training more people to be successful farmers. So that's what I've been doing the last four seasons. So you... Your model for farming, can we talk a little bit about your setup on the one and a half acres on the home farm, Le, Le Jardin de la Grelinette? Excuse me for butchering the French, but it's the only no, way I can do it with the French. Said. But can you tell us a little bit about the model that you used at the home farm? Because that's the same model that you took to the new farm and applied on a much larger scale. Yeah. So the home farm, La Grelinette, what it is, is it's a really it's a market garden so on small acreage we work on permanent raised beds and we use we don't have a tractor on that farm we use a walk behind tractor and all the beds are laid out in in 100 foot beds and they're all divided in field blocks and we use hand tools but really tight spacing so you know on 30 inch bed systems we'll have three four five six 12 rows per bed so everything is really close And we're doing multiple crops on one bed on a given season. So one crop is harvested, is replaced by another, and then replaced by another. So we're multi-cropping each bed. And, you know, that's the model that that we've been working with for quite a long time. And that's pretty much what I described in in my book, The Market Gardener. 
and all the tools and the strategies and the methods that we use on that piece of land was really determined by the fact that that's the amount of land that we had available. So really the land constraint drove us to look at alternative ways of growing more veggies. In the end, we were lucky. We found some really neat ways to do things to get really efficient and our farm became quite successful really, really fast. Yeah, that's in a nutshell, that's pretty much what we do on that home farm. And, and the farm hasn't grown in size through all these years. So it's almost 14 years now, but our production has gone up and our sales have gone up all these years. And so we've really, we've been working on, from a different perspective, which is kind of different from most farms, which is always to grow more land, to grow more produce. But we've been just kind of, because of land constraint, looking at ways to grow more produce, but on not more land. And that's pretty much where all the innovation comes from. Then when you were presented with an opportunity to grow on more land, to move up to a six acre scale in farming, you mentioned that that land constraint on your one and a half acre farm had been very important in the development of that model that you were using there. Why take that model and impose it on six acres of produce? (laughs) That's a great question. There's two answers to that. The first one is I don't know how to do any better. So even if I wanted to mechanize and fully, you know, change the system and the way I farm it, I don't really know how to do that well. So I'm kind of stuck with my framework. But the other reason, and that's joke aside, is really because that piece of ground, the reason why I wanted to do this project here is because it allowed me to train more people. Because I've always been interested in that. And, you know, from the start of my home farm, you know, I think four or five years into our, after our debuts, we already kind of having interns on the farm. And a lot of them went on to start successful market gardens on their own. And, but it's only two people per year. So I thought, you know, what if I could do eight or 10 people per year, you know, teaching them the same methods growing on small acreage. But then I needed to have a bigger campus. And instead of just changing the system, we just kind of multiplied the number of blocks. So all the beds are standardized the same, 100 foot beds. We're using the same tools, strategies, spacing, but we're just producing a lot more and we're a bigger team. So we've kind of scaled up, but we haven't really changed the model. And it was also interesting to just see how that model would do considering that we're not cultivating with tractors and we're not doing bed prep with tractors. We're still using hand tools and BCS and tarps. And I can say that so far, so good. I think this experiment here that we're running is, again, proving the point that on this farm, again, the tractor is not an essential component of, of the success of this farm, even though we're producing a lot of veggies per week. So really the choice not to go with a tractor, because I can see where a tractor would make a lot of things a little bit easier on the new farm. I mean, just with the sheer amount of ground that you have to cover, doing it on four wheels and a tractor seat, I think undoubtedly would be a little bit easier than doing it with a two-wheeled walk-behind tractor. So that choice not to do that is really more of a training choice than it is a choice of, of the ideal model to follow at six acres of vegetables. Is that fair to say? Well, that's where it becomes interesting, and that's where there's room for discussions, and I, I wouldn't say debate, because that's not the right word, but explorations of different ways of doing things, because I think that the way we're running things here, it's the same thing. I think it's the fact that we don't have a tractor that makes this farm so productive and efficient. And it's kind of hard for people to understand, but you know, just the fact that our beds, instead of going in lines, like you would on a tractor, you know, you want to go as far as possible because you're set up and, you know, once the tractor is kind of geared for one row, you just keep going that row. But we use a lot of tarps here to prepare the beds. You know, these tarps, they don't work on three, 400, 500 feet. They work on a hundred foot. And so instead of working with lines, we work with squares or rectangles. And so it's a different pattern. And in the end, you know, we'll go 100 foot with the BCS and then come back and then we'll do a thousand feet of bed, but we're not doing in one line. And there's also sorts of things that makes this interesting. You know, it's less discouraging for the crew because 
they finish their row faster and they start it. So you're always kind of starting new. Uh, it's a lot easier on the irrigation system. It's a lot easier to put tarps and landscape fabric and inset netting because you don't need to be three people holding it because it's, so there's all these little things that I found that on my home farm were, we're making my farm efficient and productive and we're, we're getting the same kind of efficiencies just by kind of spreading out that model. So we have a, an electrical cart that runs around when we do the harvest and we have a tractor when we're hauling compost. You know, so that's really when, for us, it makes a lot of sense. But besides that, we don't need it. So your comment about farming in in squares or in rectangles rather than in lines is really interesting to me because that kind of harkens back to this, what I always think of as the John Jevons style, that how to grow more vegetables than you can imagine in less space than you thought possible or whatever the title of that book was. I think it was the 1980s that that came out, which really focused on this bio-intensive spacing. Again, same idea that you weren't putting things in rows, you were more spacing things out in, uh, you know, he used a hexagonal pattern in his garden. And I'm curious how that works at a functional level because, you know, laying things out in rows is what makes it really easy to use tools like wheel hose or Planet Junior style two wheel tractors for cultivating that have gotten so much attention lately. But how do you tread that line? Because it seems clear to me that you're you're probably not out there hand pulling every weed. You need to have things lined up in such a way that that you can use some wheeled implements to get through and do some weed control. You know, that was one thing that I needed to take on here when I took this. So we designed the farm and then we kind of learn how to, it was like I'm building a big ship and then kind of learning how to navigate it. But efficiency is really what I had to deal with, especially with, with weed prevention. And, you know, we've came up, there's a few tools that came out the last few years. One of them is a double wheel hoe that has, you know, two wheels straddling over a row. And then we use discs in, in the back of that. So we use a lot of that tool to cultivate between each of these rows. So on 30 inch, I'll have six rows, let's say of carrots on 30 inch. And there's going to be two and a quarter inch between each of these rows. And that's just enough room for me to come with my wheel hoe and disc between and on the row also. So that's one example where we're kind of really going fast. And we also use a flex time weeder that is 30 inch. So we use that regularly. We'll come in, you know, 10 days after transplant or 15 days after the rec sown. And then we scratch the surface and all the germinating weeds. You know, some of them don't make it because of the scratching, but we do it a couple of times. Uh, We use the black tarps to get rid of some of the weeds. We seed onto compost to get rid of the weeds sometimes. We do that in carrots also. And the intensive spacings, you know, you talk about John Jevons and the pattern, but a big part of the biointensive strategy is to have the canopy of the crop shade out the weed. So you cultivate once, perhaps twice, but then you have the crop really taking care of the weeds. And so all of these things put together, this year is a, is a tough year for weeds because it's been really, really warm and humid, 100% humidity for the last three weeks. And this germinates, you know, weeds day and night. But we've been managing pretty well. And in contrast, when you're using tractors, your row spacing gets determined by the cultivating tractor. And so you tend to spread out more and to give more room for the tractor and the tools. And then you need more space to cover the same amount of ground. And the example I give all the time about this is that when when you're using row covers, if I'm, you know, using row cover on carrot beds that have six rows per 30 inch and somebody else is using six rows on four or five feet, then you need four or five times the amount of row cover to do the same thing. <sighs> Long-winded answer, but, you know, we've, we figure out ways here on this farm because of the urgency, and then it becomes interesting for the smaller grower because these are tools that we kind of test and experiment with that these people can use on their smaller gardens. In the end, it kind of works out. So, you know, one of the things that I found on my farm, now we were, we farmed with tractors and, and always cultivated with tractors uh, from the get-go. And we started with fairly tight spacings. Uh, you know, we had four rows, 10 inches apart. 
And over the years, we gradually kept uh, stretching that spacing out. We went to three rows at 15 and eventually ended up planting almost everything, two rows at 30 inches, primarily for disease control issues because it got us more airflow around the plants. And I'm curious with the humidity issues that you've had and then closing up that canopy so quickly, what does that do for plant disease? Chris, this is a great question because I get asked that a lot. And diseases in the garden, you know, it's been, this is going to be my 15th year growing this way, and they've never been an issue. So is this a magical way of farming or is this magical land? I die. I think that one of the answers that I've been getting a lot is that, you know, the fact that we have close spacings is also connected to the fact that we don't work the soil. So we don't till and we add a lot of compost and we're really enhancing the biological activity in the soil for the root systems to shoot down and just to have soil that is really good. And I think that some of that plays into the fact that we're less susceptible to having some disease according to pretty much all the literature that I'll read about that. So since for us, it's not an issue and it's hasn't never really been. I would say beets are perhaps the only crop that I kind of went from four rows to three rows because of circospohos. I don't know how to say that in English, but the circospora. Yeah, the little yeah. brown so spots. We, we were getting some of that and I didn't like it because it didn't look good on the leaves. So we spread it out a little bit and that helped. But it's, you know, if I counterweight all the efficiencies that I'm getting from the close facings, and the diseases that I'm not having, for me, it's, it's a no-brainer to keep those close spacing. Now, you talk about not tilling the soil, but you are doing some soil disturbance, right? Yeah, we're just not tilling. So what we do here is, is typical. So the beds are permanent, so that's the first thing. And once we want to clear a bed, if it's, there's a cover crop or a crop residue or it's really messy, we'll probably mow it down using a flail mower and then put a black tarp over it for one, two, three weeks. And then the tarps, they just kind of, by the absence of light and by the fact that you're kind of mulching what's there, you just create clean slates. And then we remove the tarps and then we start again. And so we'll put our amendments, we'll broad fork when we're doing deep root systems. So that's disturbance if you want, but a broad fork is really gentle with the soil. It doesn't invert the layers. It doesn't kill the earthworms. It does and then we will sh- we'll use a uh, rotary power harrow to only cultivate the first inch or the first two inch in the soil and make a really neat bed that way. So we're surface cultivating, but we're never inverting the layers. We're never really disturbing the bottom of the soil. And I think, you know, from all the literature that I've been gathering through the years, there's something to have value in that with regards to soil ecology. And what I've seen on my home farm, not yet on this farm that I'm at now, but after all these years of being really gentle with the soil, we have soil that is really, really loose and really beautiful, and it gives beautiful crops. And it's also amended with a lot of compost over the years. Carl Hammer from Vermont Compost Company made a comment to me he, that he can tell when somebody in his who's buying compost from them is following your methods because of just how much compost they're buying. How much compost are you putting on per acre or per bed? <laughs> yeah, he, sh- he should send me perks or something. He's a great guy, and I, I wish I could use his compost, but I'm in Canada, and that's a- there's an issue there. But, you know, I, I don't give out recommendations to people because I don't want to be responsible, but the way we've done things here is, you know, on a 100-foot bed, when we started, we were doing from six to eight wheelbarrows per bed, which is about 40 to 60 tons per acre. But then that compost is not applied everywhere all the time. So we had a, on my home farm, we have a crop rotation where we have 10 field blocks and five field blocks out of 10 get compost. And so each bed gets a lot of compost, but every two years. And so it's a lot, but on the overall of the farm, it's not that much. And what I've observed is that when you put a lot in the first few years, it helps because then you're building the biology, you're building soil structure, you're putting a lot of nutrients 
into the soil that it's going to be there for a few years. And what we've done is at one point we've put less and less. And, you know, for a couple of years, we went without putting compost. Then we went back to putting worm castings. And at my home farm now, we're back to putting compost again and bigger doses because we we see that it, it does make a nice impact on the quality of the soil and the veggies. And so there's no right and wrong about that. I think there's value in putting down a lot of organic matter into the soil, especially if you're doing intensive spacings and you're doing, you know, if we're doing four or five times more production per acre, then it's a lot of extraction of organic matter out of the garden. And so you need to replace that with a lot of organic matter that you're putting in. So that's the way I look at it. And are you making your own compost or are you buying that in? We're buying it. We've always had because we don't even have a loader at the farm and we don't have manure. And just the cost of having somebody deliver manure at the farm is the same cost as delivering compost. And then we need to make it. And, you know, I'm, I investigate because on this farm here, I'm just about to do compost. It takes a lot of manure. And from my research, if you want to really do it well, you, you kind of need to have a compost turner which is a big machine that needs a big tractor. And in the end, there's a lot of upfront costs to getting your composting area organized to have prime compost. And for me, it's just been a lot simpler to call a compost geek and say, you're excited about what you're doing. It's like Carl Hammers, it's like the best example. This guy's a total geek on compost. And I, I like that. Let's just bring it on. I'll use it. And I just think that works in synergy. On this farm, the new farm that I'm working on now, we have animals, and so we're about to start a composting program. And then are you using other soil amendments in addition to the compost, or is that really the only thing that you're using to beef up your soil? No, I think we're, we're definitely feeding the soil with compost, but we're also feeding the plants using chicken manure, mainly. It's a 531 a 30-day quick release, has a lot of nitrogen, some calcium. We use that and we use alfalfa meal. I'll use the alfalfa meal when we're not putting down compost, but this combination is pretty much what we've been doing on both my farms since the beginning. And it all came out of a fertility program that we've designed with the agronomist people that when we started trying to make sure that for the different crops that we have, we're getting enough NPK to these crops with the chicken manure and the crop, the residual of the compost. And I always thought that it's a good combination because when, you know, you put like a quick acting nitrogen base, you know, most crops will develop their leaf system, like a broccoli, let's say, and develop the broccoli because it has a lot of good nitrogen. And then it's equipped because it has, you know, a lot of, you know, solar gain because of the big canopy, then it can go down with its roots and get what the broccoli wants from the compost. So that's pretty much has been how we've we've done thing. And I think adding fertility to the soil is is I'm realizing how this is important. Like building the soil with organic matter, but making sure that you're putting enough fertility so that your crops, you know, will really thrive. It's the one-on-one of farming, but, you know, it's funny because I visit a lot of farms, and especially in France. There's a big movement towards living soils, which I really like. Like, I really hate the fact that in North America, we call it the no-till farming. It's really ridiculous because what does no-till mean? You know, what we want is living soils. But anyway, so these guys are really big on that, and they're talking about farming without using any fertilizers and transplanting in, in rye grass has been roller crimped and not putting any fertility down and letting the biology do everything. And it's really cool when you read that and it gets me inspired. But every time I visit one of these farms, the vegetables are all yellow and you really see that something's lacking there. Well, and it's something I've seen on a lot of times on beginning farms when I've gone and visited those, you know, people in their first couple of years is just the vegetables, oftentimes just the crops have a failure to thrive, you know, and it's clear that they aren't getting what they need, whether that's nutrients or water or, or what have you, but that they just, 
things are stunted. And then, of course, once you don't have enough to optimize the performance of the plants that you want, your crop plants, then everything else just kind of goes to hell in a handbasket because they can't compete against the weeds. And then your harvest takes longer because you're picking substandard crops and trying to, you know, get the yellow leaves out of the cilantro. And it was actually one of the really important lessons that I learned really late in my farming career was I was talking to a, a guy who does a lot of cilantro here and cilantro was always kind of a slow crop for us because we would harvest it and then we would have to shake out the yellow leaves and shake out the yellow cotyledons. And I was talking to this guy about how fast his crew was harvesting cilantro. And he was talking about averages up over a hundred bunches an hour per person. And he said that the secret to it really was that he had enough fertility that the cotyledons never turned yellow. They never had to shake anything out of the plant. It was just grab a bundle of cilantro, put a twist tie on it. Grab another bundle of cilantro, put a twist tie on it. They really were able to optimize their performance in other areas of the, the farm by having really great fertility in the fields. Isn't that wonderful when a grower shares a piece of advice that changes the reality of your farm? Yes, it really is. It's really, really wonderful. I can imagine how this changes the whole game. And JM, you should talk a little bit about the crop mix on the new farm at, at La Firma de Quatre Temps because back at the home farm, you're doing a CSA and a farmer's market. And so you've really got a broad diversity of crops. Whereas here on the new farm, you've really focused on a much smaller subset and really a subset that I think does require that kind of high fertility, high quality to be able to turn that into a profitable product. You're right. On my home farm, it's really a typical CSA. We have like 100 members and we do two farmers markets. So we, we want to have as much diversity as possible. And on this farm, there's a couple of things that happen. First of all, I had the, can you say that the white card, like carte blanche, we say in French, you know, I could, I could pretty much do what I wanted here, but I got kind of locked in into some financial objectives that I needed to reach at year two, three, five. And they were quite high. And so we designed the whole thing for the, you know, big goals of production. And so there was some pressure there to quickly produce. And also I was, because this farm is funded by somebody that's, you know, not a small scale farmer and does have a lot of money. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't competing with other growers with regards to CSA here in Montreal, or I, you know, I really wanted to use this farm to open up new avenues, new sales channels that weren't exploited yet to really open up the trail for others to follow. And so restaurants, I don't know, for some reason in Montreal, there wasn't that many small growers that were catering to restaurants. And so I really focused on that the first two years. And so I just developed a program where I thought, you know what, I'll have the same produce week after week after week. So I, I so that it's easy for them to know that we're reliable some Capsatan will always have Huckerai turnips, French radishes, mescaline, those mini gems. will always have, you know, specific crops. And these are all crops that are high turnover. So you plant them and then 50 days, boom, you're planting again. And these are crops that are, you know, somewhat cold hardy. So I can start them really early on and finish them really late, you know, in December. And these are all crops that when you calculate the yield per square foot, they're all in the top. And so I really focused on that. And I, perhaps I was also hanging out a lot with the YouTube guy, Curtis Stone. You perhaps have heard about him. And so he preaches that. So I kind of threw up his message listening to so many times. We went to New Zealand together and he kind of convinced me about that. So I kind of tried it and um, it worked. So we focused on, 12 of these crops for the restaurants. And then we added other crops that we do a lot of, but not as, you know, our carrot program is receding every week, radishes are receding every week, uh, mescaline we're receding, transplanting every three weeks. And so there's, there's a program for all these crops. And then we're, we're kind of supplementing with also a lot of greenhouse production. We do a lot of heirloom tomatoes, cucumbers, bell peppers, and eggplants in heated greenhouses and that's another big core of the farm here makes a lot of money too 
Talk to me about that because that's a constraint that you guys had on your home farm was that you didn't do radical season extension on your home farm. You weren't into four season production because as you told me the last time we talked, you wanted to take the winters off and go surfing. Yeah. And now you, you've, you've really changed that up. You've got a large greenhouse range there, right? At the new place. Yeah. I don't want to say that I regret those years. But man, hey, this would be fun, Chris. We would take the delivery. You know, our last CSA was November 1st. And then we would bring salad mix to the grocery store for a couple more weeks. And then mid-November, we were done. And then we'd start again in March. So that left us like four or five months every year. So the first few years, I built my house in the winter. And, you know, one year we took the whole time to go to Mexico and surf with the kids and and then I wrote a book, and then, and then that was good because the winter months were filled with that. And then I promoted the book, and that was and filled the winters with that too. And when this came along, it, it started to be more of a serious job. And so now we're there's value in kind of exploring the limits of winter production. So we're, we're doing that here. And so my, my years are not as loose and fun as before, but... I guess I'm a bit more serious, but I, I'm going to come back to the uh, the winters off at one point. So this is temporary gig in terms of me working year round, but it's really fun. If I have the chance between not farming in the winter and farming in the winter, I prefer not to farm because it's really cold when it's below frost and you're out there harvesting. But I have to say that we've pulled off a lot of cool things on this farm and it's all been filmed and documented and it's really interesting what we've come up with and it's been inspiring a lot of people in in Quebec of just realizing that okay so season doesn't stop in October it stops in December so we're picking in the fields in December and it's you know below frost using caterpillar tunnels and then mini tunnels crops that freeze and then they unthaw and then they're good to go and pretty much all the same thing that Elliot and other growers have been doing in Vermont and Maine and in upstate New York, but here it's it's kind of a different thing because it's, it's just a bit cooler still in Quebec. So we've been playing around and it's fun and it allows my crew to be on board more. And then we take a lot of the teaching and the more philosophical or technical aspects of farming we deal with them in the, in the winter months. And then when it's summertime, you know, the trainees that I have here, they're just working full on in the market garden doing 60 hours a week of planting, transplanting, cultivating, whatever. So we're, we're filling the winter months with harvests and with some prep for the next year. So in the end, it balances out pretty well. Tell me about your winter production. And is it different than the summer production? Are you using anything? Is the model any different inside of the greenhouses than it is outside of the greenhouses? Well, first of all, we have really good light here in Quebec in uh, January, February, and March. So if it wasn't for the cold, things will grow. And um, so we have some bigger greenhouses, like we have one multi-bay greenhouse, which is 90 by 110. And this one has a big volume of air, and it doesn't freeze, even if it's not heated. So we don't heat those greenhouses in the winter, but we plant and then spinach and then radishes, turnips, all the Asian greens, salanovas, and they grow. They grow slower, but they grow. And then our strategy is to have crops harvested uh, late February, start of March, and then we go on till December with pretty much these crops. You know, there's three months out of the year that we don't have them. And so we start in the big greenhouses before the tomatoes get in. And then we go to smaller cold houses that, are, again, are not heated, but, it, you know, they're protected. So we seed in there in March, early March. And then we go in caterpillar tunnels that are in our fields. And then from the caterpillar tunnels, we go to low tunnels, which are mini tunnels. And then we go to the field. And then in the fall, it's the reverse cycle. We go from field to mini tunnel to caterpillar tunnel to cold tunnel to big house 
And that's how we manage to grow eight half produce eight months out of the year, eight, nine months out of the year. So it's a lot of moving things around. And that's why those short cycle crops, they're so, you know, they're frost hardy for the main part, but also we can establish them pretty fast and go from one succession to the other. You know, I can grow beans or peas like that or other crops that are longer to take because they just, it wouldn't work out in my cycle. Because all these houses get replaced at one point with nightshades and crops that will appreciate having the extra heat in the late spring or in the summer, or crops like melons that will be happy not to have rain on them and cucumbers. And then I take it with things like the nightshades and the cucurbits that you're doing in the in the greenhouses and the tunnels, that those are trellised crops and pruned and, and really managed for maximum production. Yeah, they're managed like professional greenhouse suppliers would do, growers would do. And that was also for me, there was a learning curve because I, you know, I was okay in greenhouses, but I, I really needed to step up my game. So I learned a lot the last few years and it's really incredible. Like just, you know, having the systems, yes, but it's just learning the techniques of how to, how to really crank it with tomatoes and cucumbers and, and doing, we have eggplants that are about 10 feet high. Whoa. It's incredible. Yeah. It's just like, it's like a forest. And, you know, we visited some professional greenhouses and then just saw what that, that was like and then took some of their production plans and started to work with that. And then we're figuring out how to do that. It's pretty interesting. So just give us a little bit of information about what you figured out. I mean, when you talk about, because again, this is something I know from my own experience. It's one thing to put some tomatoes in a greenhouse and just, you know, sort of grow the tomatoes. And it's another thing to really focus on how do I maximize production and maximize the quality of, of what I'm getting out of here. And so what have you done to really maximize the quality and the quantity of what you're getting out of your greenhouses? What kinds of changes have you made? Well, let's say tomatoes. Okay, so tomatoes, they will be grafted, first of all, so that they're resistant to soilborne disease. So we can plant them year after year after year in the same space. And then we're growing them on two heads. So there's two liters and there's just one plant. So that saves a lot of space in the nursery when we start them and also saves on seeds. because So these have been hybridized so that they're resistant to diseases and, you know, they're really the top end of the cultivars that you can get. And okay, so they're grafted, they're on two liters and then they're really closely spaced. And then every week they will be trimmed and they will be they're on a wire that's eight feet high and then eventually they'll be lower and leaned and we're making sure that they're well pollinated we're making sure that the temperatures are optimal as much as we can adjusting nighttime lowering or hiring the nighttime according to where the phase of the plant is is it growing fruits or is it growing you know, more leaves, is it that the leafy stage, you know, the watering is also really well supervised with regards to outside temperatures. Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? Is it so all these variables, they're really taken seriously and we're following procedures and guidelines and it's just making a big, big difference with regards to yield, but it's a lot of time. So on this farm in this, the greenhouse is 90 by 110. And we're growing heirloom tomatoes on two heads. And the crew here were 11. And we're putting about, I would say, 100 hours per week in that house alone for the tomatoes. It's a big return, but it's a big investment in terms of time. But, you know, we're really early on. We have tomatoes at market in May, early May. And we'll have tomatoes until we rip them out in November, mid-November. So in the end, it's really worth it. JM, with that, we're going to stop here, take a quick break, get a word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with JM Fortier from La Ferme de Quatre Temps and Le Jardin, Le Jardin de La Guerlinette up in Quebec. And then we'll be right back. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. In the wild, where our crop plants' ancestors evolved their microbial partnerships, plants are provided with nutrients from the soil through the work of partner microbes in their employ. 
Wide ranging roots reach an abundant supply of nutrients and microbes, even in less than ideal conditions. And now you've gone and stuck that seed in a little tiny container and it has to get everything it needs right there in a few cubic centimeters of soil. By providing compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients, Vermont Compost ensures that your plants have what they need consistently. If they're not in the ground, your plants deserve to be in Vermont Compost potting soils, and you deserve the peace of mind of knowing that they are reaching their full potential while they're there. Makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. VermontCompost.com Supports also provided by Local Food Marketplace. Are you trying to scale up without the right systems? Instead of juggling email and text orders, spreadsheets for harvest packing and delivery, and a separate invoicing system, Local Food Marketplace's software platform will help your farm automate these tasks and decrease errors with its fully integrated system for online orders, inventory management, order packing, invoicing, and payment processing. Easily configure the system for managing multiple sales channels, customer types, price levels, and delivery routes. The platform also offers lot number traceability and an option to collaboratively sell products with other producers. Contact them via their website, localfoodmarketplace.com, to schedule a free consultation on how Local Food Marketplace can help you efficiently manage customer orders from pack house to your customer's doorstep. And we're back with JM Fortier, and I'm not going to try to say the names again because I'm not feeling up to that right now. So, JM, one of the things that you mentioned just before we went on break is you've got an 11 person crew now. And I said, I wasn't going to say it and I'm going to be stuck saying it at, at La Ferme de Quattro temps. And that's a lot different than what you had at your home farm where you were working, where it was you and Modalen and two other people working there. That's a big change. I would say that of all the biggest learning curve from going from one farm to the other, I would say beside the design stage, which is a big undertaking that went on here, the whole farm is designed with a lot of permaculture principles surrounding the market garden. And we can talk about it later on if you want. But the crew, running a crew, learning how to deal with roles and responsibilities and making sure that everybody's on board and getting good teamwork and good team spirit. You know, I've put a lot of my time figuring out this and trying out innovative ways to deal with working with groups. And uh, the first thing that I kind of decided for this project was this is a big farm. Like a typical week is about $20,000 in sales of vegetables per week. So that's the outcome of what we do during a week. So it's a lot of vegetables. This so that people understand that this is, there's 11 of us, 12 plus me, but this is over the top. You know, we're really producing a lot and we're doing a lot in a week and it's a lot to manage. And the first thing that I knew that I wanted was to have somewhat of a, the cohesion and I wanted to have everybody kind of chip in with their skills and their talents, even if they're less experienced and they are here to learn. For me, learning is doing and doing full on with your full attention And so I wanted to create a system where everybody here has a role and a responsibility and everybody's accountable. And so I've divided the crew in two. So there's the first year and the second year. And the second year, there's five key roles on the farm. One of them is dealing with the nursery. So the plant propagation and, you know, handling the calendars, making sure that everything is seeded on time. And there's another role here on the farm where it's doing all the bed prep and moving tarps and direct seeding the crops every week. There's another role that is taking care of the greenhouses. So tomatoes that are in the house, the cukes that are in the houses, dealing with that. And there's someone that's in charge of the harvest, which is two days a week, two full days where the whole crew is harvesting. So there's one person managing that. And there's one person managing all of the phyto protection, dealing with insects, calling the shots on which crop needs to be cultivated, where, when, insect pressures. These are my five key staff that deal with that. And these guys, they're in charge when we're doing that. So when we're in the nursery, everybody works for Alice, which is the the woman in charge of the nursery. So let's say we're doing Wednesday afternoon in the nursery. So she runs the crew. She tells everybody what to do. And she's the lead on that. 
And then Alice, when we're doing the tomato house, she will work for Nathalie, who is in charge of the tomato house. And so when we're doing that on Monday, so Nathalie's running the crew, she's deciding what everybody's going to do, where, when, she's calling shots. And it's been really, really cool to have everybody on board that way. And for me, it allows me to not have all the pressure of thinking about everything all the time and dealing with all of these variables. It's, there's so much complexity. And then we get together every week on Monday morning, five of them and me, and we predetermine everything that needs to be done on the week. We write it on a board. And then we bring the other crew after lunch on Monday. And then together we revisit all of these things. So it's all laid out, the week's work. And then people chip in with their opinions. And we're making sure that everybody understands what needs to happen. And then twice a day, morning and afternoon, we dispatch who's doing what and who's in control. And that's where I do some of that. And so it's been a very interesting way of running a farm. I'm the boss. I have the last word, but this is year three of running the crew. It's, and I've pretty much reached that objective where the crew is self-running. It's really cool. <laughs> Another long answer. No, that's good. I mean, I, I want to dig into this because getting people to do that kind of work is not always easy. And, you know, trying to get people to operate at that higher level. How are you getting people to engage that way? What I've seen here, and I have a feeling that it's pretty universal, is that when you empower people, really, and you really give them the keys to the car, they'll go for a drive because they're here to learn how to farm and they want to have their own farm. So what I tell them is that, okay, this is the guideline. So I have standard operating procedures for everything we do here on the farm. So that was my role. And then we have a certain way of how we do things. I show it to them when they come to the first year. And then I tell them, so my expectation is that you're in charge and then you'll make mistakes and I'll be there with you to make sure that they're not too big mistakes. And then they go off. And Chris, I'll tell you, so the people that I've worked with so far, they're younger than me. And in many instances, they're a lot more intelligent than me and just they're as passionate. So it's just perfect. (laughs) I feel that I'm benefiting from their talents. And I've always kind of looked at it. I'm a hockey fan because in Quebec, we all follow the Montreal Canadiens. I just feel that I'm kind of more of a coach on this project here. That's how I'm running the crew. Like, I'm not going to really put my skates and try to make a difference that way. I'm going to help you become a better player. So that's the role I wanted to take. And it's really been wonderful what the outcome has been. You said the standard operating procedures was something that you had developed before you got your crew in place. And it seems like that's something that's really important. It's not so much that you're empowering people to say, go figure out how to do transplant production. It's that you're saying, here's how we do transplant production at this farm. And I'm empowering you to do it in the way that we've already lined out. Yeah, exactly. And it's very clear. And I tell them that if you want to change this, check with me first. <laughs> Don't change it on the fly. And because, you know, my role here on this farm and on this project is figuring out the best practices of how to do all the little things on the farm. So that's what I do. I study and I, I look at how we do things and I have some time to think about, okay, is this the optimal way? And I, I have the chance to visit a lot of farms around the world. So I see a lot of stuff and then I come and when there's an operating procedure and I can come and look at the procedure and say, is this the optimal? Can I change this or that? And then that's how we figure out optimal way of doing things. But yeah. And you know, I, I need to give you credit for that because you came to this farm the first year I was kind of designing it and imagining it. And you were telling me about having procedures, how that was important because you were running bigger crews than I had been. And so I, I paid attention to that, and I think it's really, really important. And now that I have them dialed down, and you know, all the things that we do, they're written, and I can't imagine how big farms can operate without something like that. Everybody improvises? How, how can that work? It gets pretty ugly. I've, I've been there. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and I want to say there's another thing, Chris, another great piece of advice that you gave me 
that I would say has been the number one thing that has made this project, the working with the crew of this project, fun and successful is that when I went to one of your workshops, you stressed out the importance of calling out workers when they're doing something right and making sure that you're enforcing that, not when people are doing something wrong. It's just been so powerful how this has been working here on this farm. So I will walk the field just like a foreman does, and I'm looking for when they're doing things right. So it's fun. And when I go to them and I walk silently and I say, hey, Leo, what you're doing there is exactly how I want you to do it. Keep on doing it. And he feels happy. Anyway, everybody should try that. Geez, I wish I would have known that when I was raising my kids when they were younger. <laughs> yeah. It would have been better and better outcome. I don't know. Yeah. To all the listeners out there, this works, man. You empower people by telling them when they're doing things right and you're clear with your expectations and it's so much more positive. How did you go about documenting procedures and getting clear with your expectations? Because that's something that takes no small amount of time to do. Uh, the last four years, I was dedicated 150% to this project. So before coming to this farm, and, you know, funny story, it was, it was hanging out again with, you know, I've been pretty much following what Elliot Coleman was doing forever. And you know, I'm a big fan of, of his work and of him personally. And we've became friends over the years. And he's the one that introduced me to the owner of this farm. He was working with Elliot and he didn't want to commute eight hours to come to a farm <laughs> to this project. So he kind of connected me and I, I was hesitant at first, but when I met the owner of this farm, I decided to we really had a vision that was common, even if we came from very different backgrounds. He wanted to make an impact, a social impact, and he wanted to change agriculture. And I was like, man, I'm all about that. So we, we kind of connected that way. But all of the touring and all of the promoting of my book and my work and my teachings and my message of you don't need to have big acreage to start a farm that I was really passionate about, I, I needed to put that aside for a little while and focus on this project. So I really put my complete attention to this and my mind and my imagination and researched a lot. And then eventually I just, we did a first season and we, I had some notes of how I wanted to do that. I was pretty much following what's written in the market gardener and it, was, it works. And so I was following that because that, these were my experiences of the past, but now we, you know, I've improved a lot of that. And then a second season in the winter, I put all of that on paper and then we worked with these protocols, making sure that they were working, and then we changed some of them for the better. And then year number three, we're pretty much set with all of these protocols. And I know they work because we repeat the same things week after week after week. And so it's a lot of researching and taking the time. And again, these winter months, they're, they're good for that. Now, are you still involved in the home farm at all? My wife runs it without me and she says it's the best thing ever because you know she keeps it simple and I'm not there to kind of mess everything up because I'm always trying to do experiments and trying new tools and doing this and that so she keeps it really simple I think also she likes the fact that now people will recognize her work through the farm because before because of the book and because of the popularity that I have you know, we would be together and people would come up and say, oh, man, your garden's awesome and your work is amazing. <laughs> She'd be just say, what about me? Like I'm doing all, you know, he's he's on a tour talking. I'm, I'm picking the peas and the beans. And so I think that when I left the farm, a lot of that also kind of followed me here. And so she never really liked the hype around the book and all of that. So she's more she does what she wants. She keeps it simple and she gets all the credit for the success of that farm because the farm is really successful still. She's, this year, her sales are $170,000 and she's keeping half of that as her salary. So it's pretty amazing. That's really great. Has it been weird for you to make that change from being so involved? I mean, you know, on a four-person crew, you're really 
doing a lot of the work. You're picking the beans and bunching the kale and, and running the broad fork. And I imagine that's fairly different for you now in this larger operation with the larger crew and, and the role that you've described for yourself. Has that been an, a difficult transition for you? Well, I would say that not picking beans has not been so difficult. <laughs> just, I agree. Yeah. I've never been a big fan of picking beans. So now if I can find a way to not pick them, perhaps I will, but I want to also be with the crew. But I would say that there was a lot of changes. I commute from my farm to this farm. So it's like a 45 to an hour drive. It's, you know, there's no traffic, but still, that was very new to me. And I started farming, I was 20, 22. And now I'm, now I'm 40. So, you know, pretty much my whole adult life has been on my farm or on a farm while I'm there. And so now I'm commuting and then there's a lot of pressure on this project because it needed to happen really fast. There was no models of what we've created. Like I had to really be intense. And then, you know, the fact that I'm working for a super wealthy business person, a lot of different growers in my community here didn't see that with a good eye. So there was a lot of gossips about that. And that affected me a lot the first year. You know, anybody that transitions from one situation to another, there's there's growing pains, but it was really stretching my comfort level because I was I was an expert at what I was doing on my home farm. And now it is like I needed to restart something totally new. And I I felt a, like a beginner again, but I took on the challenge and I went through those pains and I, I've learned so much. I'm such a better grower now. You know, I feel I have so many more assets and skills set that I didn't have before. Then, you know, these were growing pains and they're, we're, I'm not totally done with them because there's some, still some challenges. This year is year number three of running the farm. And I was aiming to have the crew be kind of self-sufficient at year three or four. And I've achieved that this year. So, you know, I don't need to physically be with the crew all the time. They can self-manage. But now that I've achieved that, and that was a goal, and it was a big process, and a lot of my work went into that, I realized that, oh, I want to be in the crew. Actually, I want to be picking the beans with the crew. So it's funny how, you know, sometimes you need to do something to realize that what you have, I don't know. So next year, I'm, I'm thinking about starting to running the crew again, because I kind of like being outside and doing the work and finishing at 5, 5.30, feeling great, because I just had a nice day and I prefer that to having meetings and working with contractors and the excavation guys and just making phone calls. This is, yeah. Picking beans is not my favorite, but you know, I'll pick the carrots. <laughs> you mentioned that when you were designing the farm, that that was a real challenge for you and something that really pushed your limits and, and that you were trying to follow some permaculture principles when you were putting together the farm design. So can you talk to us a little bit more about the design of this new farm? Yeah. So I would say for like three or four years, I traveled a lot presenting my work and my book around the world. And a lot of the people that would come out to these workshops were people that were interested in permaculture. And so I've met a lot of people from the permaculture community and a lot of great teachers and a lot of great presentations about permaculture and design. And so when I had the opportunity to start this project, I really wanted to integrate some of that into how the farm was built. Long story short, one of the things that we did was we're working with field blocks and all the field blocks are standardized in length. So they're all 40 by 100 and there's 40 of these field blocks on the farm. But all the field blocks are surrounded by flowering hedgerows that are attracting beneficial insects. There's a lot of birdhouses in those hedgerows. These hedgerows are also acting as windbreaks. And so we've created a lot of these enclaves where the crops are belted by a lot of natural habitats, created a lot of dry creeks for the water runoff that goes into the ponds. And these create habitats for toads and for snakes, non venomous snakes that eat the mice here. And so we've created a lot of little habitats. And it was all designed on paper with all of this landscaping features 
included in the market garden. And so we're doing, it's really beautiful. If people look up, I mean, they go on your website and they'll see the website of, of this farm and they'll see pictures. It's really, really beautiful. But it was also trying to see if we could get an ecosystemic approach to pest management by building all of this biodiversity on this farm. Could it be that we would need to rely on insect nets or on pesticides? And because this is an experimental farm and I had the means to do what I wanted, we went full on with that. And I, I was inspired by how farms were in France before. I have a lot of old books of how farms were were in France, market gardens in France, and there was always these hedgerows, these flowering hedgerows. And I wanted to reestablish those. And so far, so this is year, year number four of when these were planted. They're really beautiful. I'm looking at them now. We have the agronomist from the governments that are there measuring every week. They come and measure the insect pressures. And it's really funny. They have uh, vacuums where they're sucking the bugs in. And they're doing all these research to see if, if this makes a difference or not. But I'm still using the nets so far because <laughs> I'm always kind of scared of, uh, I haven't made the jump yet. I think it's one of the really hard things with doing biological pest control in a, or ecological pest control in a market garden situation is that the, the tolerances for damage in the crops is, is really low because it's such a visual marketplace. It's not a, you know, if you're growing corn, right. And you take a 10% yield hit, but you save on pesticides or you save on pest control activities, then that's good. And it's easy, you know, because nobody's judging the quality of your corn plant. What you're really looking at is a yield situation. And whereas, you know, for you, if you've got a worm in your broccoli, one worm is really unacceptable. And it's not a whole lot different than having 100 worms. Yeah, flea beetles, they're really hard to keep in check. But, you know, I think there's a lot of value in that. And the fact that we're trying this, and I, and I think there's a bright future for this. It's about figuring out how. It's hard to discuss this with the perhaps people listening to this not having seen this farm and what these hedgerows look like. I have a feeling that we're going to touch on something in the next few years. This takes time for the ecology to really establish. Just the birdhouses in the spring. It's just so wonderful to have. We have like hundreds of birds humming over our heads. And yeah, the fact that we don't work with tractors also, it's like we're listening to birds. And it's a pleasant environment. It's beautiful. I think all of this, in the end, creates an experience that is relevant to farming. It is our working space. It's our working conditions. It's like if you're in a factory and there's AC or there's not AC or the walls are nicely painted and there's nice music or not. This makes a difference in factories and on farms. We rarely look at our farms in terms of, is it beautiful? Is it interesting to be in it? How's my washing station? Is it ergonomic? Is it efficient? So all of this, I've really put a lot of my time to that here. And I think it makes a difference. With these perennial beneficial insect hedgerows that you've put in and you've got them, you know, there's a lot of them on your farm. How are you managing weed control in those? I'm not. You're not. Okay. Tell me about that because don't you end up with thistle seeds? Yeah, they do come up that I leave them. I trim them using a weed whacker. So I'll just come and it's like a, a wall of weed whacking and I'll just trim everything down, you know, to cut the edge and to make sure that they're straight. But they were planted on, when we did those, there was some extra soil that was added for the berming. And then there was cardboard and then the plants were planted through the cardboard and the soil was weed-free soil. It was landscaping soil. And then the cardboard, and then they put ramule wood chip or wood chips over that. And then they seeded clover over that. So there's, you know, there's a pretty good space. And then they're taking all the space. So there's not that many weeds that are popping through them. But the ones that are, are I just leave them. It's just, I can't deal with that. It's, it would be too much. And I don't think it's a problem. You used permaculture principles in, in designing the farm. Would you advertise... La Ferme de Quattro Temps is being a permaculture operation? No, because first of all, it, it would attract a lot of people that would have a different 
understanding of, of what we're doing. Like this is a production farm. It's really a farm. You know, I've, I've studied permaculture ever since I got interested in farming. And, you know, for me, like a book like Bill Mollison's two big books, Culture One and Two, they're just, they're awesome books because they talk about design and they talk about patterns, talk about how to organize, you know, from a bird's eye view. So pretty much all my interest in farm design is really strong when I read these books. But, you know, when we're talking about permaculture in farming, usually this is a market garden and we're working for profit. We're working for production, we're interested in having high yield. And there's a, there's a high level of energy that goes into the garden. So permaculture, usually when they're talking about production and farming, it's usually for self-sufficiency or for things that are less energy intensive. And this is not what, what we're doing. So I would never call it that, but I call it a, per, uh, a market garden, and, but I was strongly influenced at the design stage by permaculture principles. And I think that's a clear and simple way to just state what this is. Jam, before we turn to the lightning round, you've been working on a really big project, this market gardener's master class. And I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that project, because that's been, a, I think, a pretty big focus for you over the last couple of years. Well, yeah, that's the other thing. That's the other part that, you know, when I wrote The Market Gardener, I was thinking, and I think I was right about that, that people that are starting out, it's better if they have a guideline, if they have a role model, if they have a at least one way of doing things throughout that they can kind of follow and one way that works. And and that's how I wrote my book. And that was my intention because, you know, farm farms and farms and farmers and context were all different and there's different ways to skin a cat. You'll hear that all, all the time, but actually it's a lot easier to just find one person that will teach you how to do things from start to finish. And that's a method. And that's what I was, doing with my book and then people would read it and people still read it and they like it but when they see what we do they've I've always felt that it was clear and so we've started to really document all the things that we do on the farm from start to finish how we do carrots from the rex to how we pull them off the ground how we watch them how we store them and how we sell them so that there's a method that you can follow and so I've been documenting that for all the veggies and explaining in videos and in text all of the different strategies that we use on the farm about how to grow things. And I feel that I have some workers here that I'm teaching these methods. There's 10 of them. It used to be two, so it's better, but why not, why not a thousand? So that's my intention there. And the course is doing really well. There's 800 students from 45 different countries. It's a really nice ecosystem. There's a lot of people interacting. There's peer groups. And it's just, for me, it's a great way to keep on um, passing down what I know and how I think things can be done to help others. And uh, I can change and edit, which is the big difference with books. Like once the book is out there, boom, it's the static way. But with video imaging, you can come back and edit and add, oh, so there's a new trick here. This is how we figured out how best to do that now. And so it's very dynamic. It's been an exciting project. And if people want to check it out, they can look on, on your website. I want to give you guys, a, the, the listeners, a, a discount and a promo code for the class so they can check that out. All right. And so that promo code is Farmer to Farmer Podcast. It's all one word. And it's my understanding, JM, that right now enrollment's not open, but it's going to reopen at the end of September, right? Yeah, we're doing so because we want to keep this at a level where people can connect, we have cohorts. So there's going to be four cohorts per year. And so you sign up. It's like when you go to, you know, university, you register at X date, and then your class starts at that date. So that's how we've set it up. It's going to open in September. People can subscribe to the newsletter and they'll get they'll get an email that tells them when, when that's open. But yeah, that's another thing. Like I wanted to create not just a space where I can give some of the methodologies that I've learned and that I'm doing here, but also to create 
an ecosystem. You know, when I say there's growers from 45 different countries, it's really cool because when you read the treads, you know, let's say we have a Facebook group like group. It's not Facebook, but it's another kind of internal thing. It's really interesting to read the perspectives and the different things from people growing in Croatia, people growing in France, people growing in Patagonia. It creates a really dynamic uh, circle of market gardeners. And um, I would say of all the things that I've done the last four or five, that piece of the puzzle for me is, uh, is, is one of the most rewarding because I see and I read that people, it's impacting their farming, which is what I wanted to do. I think the market gardener, when I wrote it, my interest was to help uh, aspiring farmers start on the right track, but this is taking them to an, uh, uh, the next level, you know, teaching best practice on each of the crops. Jam, with that, we're going to turn to our lightning round, but first we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor. This lightning round is brought to you by High Mowing Organic Seeds. When your livelihood depends on the quality of your seeds, be confident in your investment. When you grow organically, you need to know that your seeds are selected to perform in organic conditions. High Mowing offers professional quality seeds grown by organic farmers for organic farmers. Visit High Mowing online to request a free copy of their 2018 seed catalog, read about the company's mission, and browse over 700 organic varieties, including tried and true market standards, all new high performance hybrids, and beloved heirlooms. Use the code F2FSEEDS when you purchase online, or mention the code when you call to receive a 10% discount on purchases of $100 or more. Visit highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer or call 866-735-4454 to get started. JM, what's the best advice you've ever gotten? The best advice, there's a couple, okay? Can I have more than one? I, I think you bet. my wife really keeps me in line. She always says, stay humble and stay grounded. And, you know, so I really like that because every time I've stepped out of that, it didn't work out for me and I didn't feel good. So I like to follow her advice about that. And um, I think the best advice came from my father when he said, you know, my father taught me at a really young age to always make action lists. <laughs> and that's what I've always done. Anytime I feel overwhelmed or anything, I just sit down and I write everything that needs to happen, every, all the list of everything that needs to be done. And when I do that, it just calms me and it gets me focused and organized. And I think that allows me to be successful also because I'm organized. What is your wife, Moda Len's superpower? Oh, man, she's so patient. She's so loving. She's so, yeah, she's very loving. She's very patient with me, especially. We're very different. I'm more kind of outspoken. She's more inward. But when she talks, you listen because there's something that's deep. Yeah, I think uh, she's just she's just awesome. And she is a superwoman. So she has a lot of superpowers. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Read the market gardener. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and for real, because, you know, there's, Man, there's so many ways you can start wrong. Like, just follow something that works, and then you can get your groove later on. But, you know, one of the best farming advice that I got when I started was read Elliot Coleman's New Organic Grower, which I, I did probably 45 times because I was trying to figure that out. That's the advice that I would give to young farmers. JM, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast again today. Chris, it's a real pleasure, and I'm sure you know this, Chris, but a lot of people listen to the podcast. It's really important for them, and I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. It's really, really appreciated by a lot of people in the farming community, so thank you. Thank you so much, JM. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again, this is episode 173 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for JMF. That's J-M-F. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. 
Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmer to farmerpodcastcom If you like the show, head on over to iTunes, leave us a review. If talk to us in the show notes, tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I am working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help right there. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. Mm-hmm.